Thank you, thank you, Guru. Um, <clears throat> so yesterday and today, uh, we had some great talks about real deployments of SDN from Google, from NTT this morning, descriptions from NEC and, and from others. There was one takeaway for me, and that was during Urs's talk yesterday, someone leaned over to me and said, the world just changed. And I think that that's, that's correct. In the way that we design networks, the way that networks will be built, the, the world indeed has just changed. But where is, it, where is it going? What is this going to mean for the industry? You've heard this analogy before of the networking industry following the pattern of the computer industry of the 1980s. And I want to describe this again because I think it's still very relevant. In the 1980s, if you wanted to buy a computer, a mainframe computer, that was essentially all you could buy. You'd buy it from IBM, from whom you would buy specialized hardware from IBM, specialized operating system from IBM, specialized applications from IBM. The idea was only they knew how to do it right because it was all integrated. That was the only way that you could make it work. They knew best. And then the microprocessor came along from merchant providers and eventually, of course, the rise of Intel with an open interface, a well-published instruction set that allowed people to design control planes operating systems. And then we had a proliferation of different operating systems that have grown over the last 20 years. And then POSIX and open interfaces on top of that have allowed a proliferation of applications. So to belabor a point, a vertically integrated, closed, proprietary industry with slow innovation that was a relatively small industry turned into something that was much faster it was horizontalized, it was delaminated, it was unbundled. The open interfaces allowed for much, much faster innovation and a much bigger industry. Everybody benefited. And IBM didn't do so badly out of it either. So what's happening in the networking industry, the mainframe of the, uh, of the, two, of the 21st century? Well, we buy specialized hardware, we run specialized control planes and specialized feature on top because only the vendor knows right. Only the vendor knows how to make this stuff work. But what's happening, and we all know this, is that the rise of merchant silicon from a number of companies, and now with open interfaces, OpenFlow as an example, is allowing for many control planes. I've seen six in the last 24 hours. So there is proliferation, competition, innovation in the control planes. And on top of that, many new applications. And I think there we've just seen the beginning. Vertically integrated, closed, mainframe mindset, I think this is the way to think of the, computer, of the networking industry today, is moving to horizontal open interfaces and much, much faster innovation. We are all better off because of it. <clears throat> at the last summit, at the first summit, a good friend and hero, Scott Schenker, gave a terrific talk. If you have not seen it, you must go and watch the YouTube video of it. The title was The Future of Networking and the Past of Protocols. Five years ago, that would have been heresy to say the past of protocols, because that's what networking is all about. But what he laid out was a beautiful description of the abstraction, the new abstractions that are, that are being created. Let me just summarize that, that here. By providing a global view of the state of the network, by having both visibility and control over the forwarding plane, can provide a global view upon which a network virtualization layer can create abstract views, abstract views of that physical network to different control programs. And the control programs can then be a function of that view. So think of a control program as a function of the view of the network. And so we may have many control programs written by and created by different people. This is going to be the starting point for what I'm going to talk about today. 
And that is, how do we make this stuff work? How will we as a community make this stuff work? Because developers will create programs on top, these control programs, and I show a somewhat silly toy example here of a firewall that is just written in some high-level high level language, not a particularly high-level one in this case, but as a, as a, on this abstract view, that will then be compiled down eventually through those layers of control program, and, uh, from the control program through the network operating system, the control plane, and then compiled and written down into the forwarding path. You take what you want, and then you compile it down so that it happens. Totally different from the way things work today. But this creates all sorts of opportunities for stuff to go right and for stuff to go wrong. But the, th the thing to notice is that the entire operation of the network, once this, these steps have taken place, is defined by the tables. Because we're compiling down into a set of tables, those flow tables, and each flow table is really just a sequence of match plus action primitives. You match on of packets of a particular type, and when you match, you perform a particular set of actions. So match plus action is really all that's expressed in those tables. As a consequence of this particular model, with SDN, we will. We will formally verify that our networks are behaving correctly. And we will identify bugs, then systematically track down their root cause. This is my claim. And the we here is we as in those people who are developing programs. The we are the people who are building and operating networks. And the we are also the developers and the researchers who are going to try and put together the tools and techniques to make this possible. And we saw some great examples yesterday in the session that Jennifer Rexford was, was chairing. It's worth asking, what do other industries do? I mean, testing is, is basic to every engineering discipline, developing drugs, airplanes, software. And we need to do testing and, and formal design because we're imperfect at predicting how our creations will behave. That is true across all of engineering. So let's look at an example of how ASICs work. The cost of making a mistake in an ASIC is uh, millions, perhaps 10 or $15 million. So the idea is don't make a mistake ever. And in order to do this, there's a very well, uh, 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 well thought out design process, a methodology, starting from a specification through a functional description, the RTL written in Verilog or VHDL, alongside as much effort being put into test benches, test vectors, verification, then going through functional verification, a number of tools taking us closer and closer to the physical layout, and eventually the manufacturer validation by taking those tests that we created at the beginning in order to test that the system does what we want. We take this for granted, but this is a $10 billion tool business, and it's supporting a $250 billion industry, an industry which is smaller than the networking industry. And we all know the many, many, many tools and techniques that have been developed. And that's built on a set of techniques, a set of techniques such as automatic test vector generation, interactive debugging through the design compiler and then re uh, iterating on the design, defining invariants and then checking those invariants at every stage of the design, and then formal methods to compare something that is below a compiler with that which generated it to check that uh, that has been correctly synthesized. In order to make all of this work, there's been a huge amount of effort. There are hundreds of books. I was able to find, without too much effort, more than 10,000 papers that describe the intellectual foundation of this. And at a university, we teach tens of classes on techniques related to this. So there's a very, very strong intellectual basis. Same goes for the software industry. You start with a specification, functional description, the code, a lot of uh, verification and test benches, and then a whole smattering of techniques. Everybody has their own process, agile design, whatever the technique that's, uh, that's, that's, that's in vogue uh, today. 
a $10 billion tool industry supporting a $300 billion industry. Many, many techniques. And again, the same kind of intellectual ideas, automatic test generation, invariant checking, very commonly used, model checking for checking the correctness of the, the code through formal methods, and then interactive debugging at the end, GDB and its variants, in order to be able to track down those bugs and find their root cause. Not surprisingly, there are not just tens, there are hundreds of books on software development techniques and software engineering. More than 100,000 papers and tens of classes offered. So what do we do? What does our industry do? What do we do to make networks work? We have Traceroute, Ping, TCP, SNMP, and NetFlow. And actually, that's about it. So where's our $10 billion support for, for our industry? So what is it that we're trying to do with these tools? We've all used them, and many of us have taught students how to use them, and they've had this uncomfortable feeling of, is that it? Don't we have anything more to show? So what is it that we're actually doing? Let's take a look at, this is a picture of the Stanford backbone. Um, that's the topology overlaid on our, our, on, our, on our campus. Imagine that we were doing a trace route to try and find out how the network was behaving. We would send a packet, and that packet is going to traverse the network. And it's going to essentially be probing those layer two, layer three, and ACL tables, and whatever other tables happen to be in those boxes. We're essentially trying to observe and identify the state that is distributed across all of those boxes. That state that was put there by a spanning tree algorithm, learning, uh, OSPF, BGP, the network operator that was there yesterday manually logged in and configuring things, things that were exchanged from other boxes and then inserted for which I have no visibility and I have no control. So we're essentially trying to observe something that is extremely complicated for which we have no real ability to do so. And as a consequence, it's very, very hard. That complex interaction between multiple protocols on a given switch or router, between the state on different switches and routers. There are multiple uncoordinated writers of that state. The operator can't observe the state and cannot control the state. So it's not surprising that these systems barely work. And in fact, today, networks are kept working by what Scott called the masters of complexity. Right? They really, truly are heroes, these people that keep these networks working. But we rely on a small and very rare breed of these masters of complexity in order to be able to understand, because they have to guess. They have to estimate. They have to use their experience rather than having automated tools. And so if you look and say, where, are those, where is that intellectual foundation for this discipline? There's kind of a handful of books. There are almost no papers. And there certainly aren't any classes. There's no abstract notions. There's no rigorous intellectual foundation to what we do. And in fact, one could say that the philosophy of making networks work, I like to think of it as like a yo-yo. You're on your own. It, it, in Britain, we have a different way of saying this, uh, which is, you're on your own, mate. That's basically where you are when you're running your network. So why is it that I say that with SDN, we will formally verify that our networks are behaving correctly. We will identify bugs, then systematically track down their root cause. Well, we can exploit this function of a view to express what our intent is more formally, and then follow that through the compilation down to the insertion of the state in the tables, and then track that the entire network is doing what we intended. There are several places where things can go wrong. We might start by writing a bad program. Or inside the infrastructure, the, the control plane, the virtualization, the, the software infrastructure, that might be incorrect. We might have logical errors in our program. The state that gets put down into the uh, that's compiled into the state of the network, those tables, those match plus action 
primitives that are in, in the network. They might contain bugs as well. The compilation process may be incorrect. Even if everything else is correct, even if we write a good program, even if everything is compiled down correctly, something might go wrong. There could be a hardware failure. There could be a memory failure. There could be a line card that breaks. There could be a link that fails. So there could be, despite everything else being correct, we may find that there are errors at the lowest level that even uh, all of our formal methods have, have failed to catch. So we're going to look at some examples. I'm going to walk through some, some, some examples here. We saw some great examples yesterday and uh, the, the work that's going on at Princeton and at Cornell in how to describe and how to write that language, how to write that control program in the first place to minimize the chances of creating a bug in the first place. I'm going to be talking about three methods that are complementary to that. One is the static checking of the state of the network, Independ independently checking whether it's doing the right thing, so independent checking of correctness. Then automatic testing in terms of asking, is the data path, is the networking forwarding path behaving correctly? Is it actually doing what I wanted it to? Even if all of the state is correct, is it implementing that state and operating upon that correctly? And the last is interactive, in, interactive debugging. When all else fails, how can I go in and try and track down bugs, find out what caused them in the first place? So I'm going to go through these as three different steps. The first one was work that was, that was done with, with Payman, James, and uh, colleague George Varghese from UC San Diego. This is on static checking. How do we independently check the correctness? So in today's networks, very simple questions. Very simple questions are quite hard to answer. A question like, can host A, can computer A, talk to computer B? That's where we get resort to the pings and the trace routes to try and figure it out. It'd be nice just to be able to examine the state and say yes or no. What are all the packets that could reach B from A? What are all the set of packets and the headers that could be sent from A and reach B? Are there any loops in the network? Is group X entirely provably isolated from group Y? Can I be sure that they can't communicate? What happens if I remove a line in the config file? Well, nobody dares to do that. So the flow table state is like the machine code for the network. It's not something that we should have to look at, but it tells us precisely how packets are going to be processed. So that's, that's held in, the, in, in, in that state. So we're going to look at this by assuming that off to the side there is a static checker that is going to sit and examine this state and tell us whether it's doing the right thing. It's going to read and pull out all of that state, examine it, and then compare it against a policy which indicates our original intent. Any large organization has such a policy. It says things like person A can't talk to person B, laptops can't accept incoming connections, VoIP phones can't move for E911 compliance, Guests to the hospital can't reach, can't read patient records. So things like, things like that. Stanford campus, we have 137 of these policies. Any large institution has, has the same kind of thing. We can take those and compile them and then compare them against the state that's in the network and see is that policy being, is, is being met. There are a number of ways that you could do this. The, the, the way that I'm going to describe in a moment is something called header space analysis, which is just building on this match plus action primitive that's in the network. So in header space analysis, we're going to consider how a packet progresses through this network, how it gets processed, and use that as a way to understand what will happen to any packet as it passes through the network. So we're going to assume that all packets, there's a packet shown here, has a header, and that header we're going to assume is no more than L bits long. Those L bits represent a point in an L-dimensional space. Right, there are 2 to the 11, 2 to the L different possible headers. And so this particular header represents a point in that space shown here. I can only show three dimensions on the slide. But as it progresses through the network, it will be it's the decision as to how it will be processed will be based on its location in that space. And it might move in that space because the packet may be modified. A header may be overwritten, a checksum may be updated. So as it moves through the network, then that, will, that, that packet will move. 
So we can think of the network as being a transformer, a geometric transformer of that space, of all packets in that space. And in fact, at any one time, it is at a particular port location in the network and in a particular location within that space. So if we map all of these out in the, the set of all ports, there are four ports of interest in this network, then we can think of that packet as making a, taking a path through that space. So when it hits the first router or the first switch, it will be transformed. Here the packet header was changed slightly, it was moved to port two. And that's just a, a movement in this geometric space. Or we can think of all of the packets fitting within that, that, that region as being moved en masse. They would all be processed identically as they move through the network. So as we go through, we can think of transform functions, here shown in, uh, uh, as, as the transfer function of how a header at a, arriving at a particular port would be processed as it goes through the network. If we then place these back into the network, then we can see how any particular packet will be processed or how any particular packet can reach from A to B. Now, if we want to know how A can talk to B, then we can simply take that big cube on the left-hand side, which represents all possible packets. So we ask the question, take all possible packets and say, which one of them sent from A could reach B? And so now these transfer functions will filter that space down as it goes through, and we can, we can, uh, uh, we can form the, the, the entire equation for the network from step to step just by repeating this, this process at each router. And then we can say definitively in this particular case that any packet sent from A will be filtered down to that set on the right, a small subset that can reach B. And then if we want, we can take the inverse function back to the beginning, and that will tell us which packets A could have sent to reach B, that set of packets that they could send. So now we can say with confidence, provably from the state of the networks, precisely which packets A can send to B. Don't need to send any packets to find that out. We just look at the state and it will tell us. And then we can check that against the policy and see whether that's what we intended. The consequences are we can find all those packets. We can find loops, of course, regardless of their protocol or layer. Notice I didn't mention layer three, layer two, layer four. It was just a collection of bits. This will work in any of those uh, for any protocol that exists today or any protocol that we choose to create in the future. If you want to add a new encapsulation format, it immediately is included. We can prove that two groups are isolated by showing there's no reach reachability between those sets of groups and therefore prove that the network will adhere to the policy. So this was all inspired by OpenFlow, Match Plus Action Primitive, and SDN. In a simplified work, it'll act, way, it'll actually work on an existing network as, as well. It doesn't give you quite the same power on the, on the networks we have today. But we took this as an example, uh, uh, the, the Stanford backbone, and uh, asked the same set of questions. <clears throat> on our backbone, we have 750,000 IP forwarding rules. 1,500 ACLs and 100 VLANs. So typical of a, of a fairly large enterprise or, or college campus. And we could ask questions like, could A talk to B? And then tell us the entire set of headers that A could use to talk to B. So what are the protocols? What are the routes? What are the paths that A could use in order to talk to B? And there's a tool that Payman uh, created called Hassle that uh, will, you can run this in your network too if you'd like, reads the, the, in this case, the Cisco IOS configuration, checks the reachability, the loops, and isolation. It takes about 10 minutes to run for the Stanford backbone. You could make this run much faster. It's actually very easily made parallel. Uh, you could do this in a second every time you update the tables if you wanted. So it's available for free for you to run. Come and ask us if you're interested in trying it. We can take this step one step further <clears throat> and ask a lower level question. And that lower level question could be, we know that the state is doing what we want and adhering to our policy, but what if the state, while correct, is being implemented or executed incorrectly? So the tables might reflect the policy that we want, but the hardware might not be following the tables. There could be hardware errors, there could be a link failure, or there could be malicious errors. Right? So the people who would, who would care about this are, for example, healthcare networks where they're, they're, they're told and hold to the level of HIPAA compliance and uh, face severe fines if they don't meet it, 
or credit card and financial networks who have high compliance standards as well. And of course, military and intelligence networks where they'd be interested in checking that the network is behaving correctly. And really anyone who needs to know correct operation that needs to know that the network is correct, operating correctly. <clears throat> so in our case, this means taking a look at the state of the network and then trying to figure out packets that we could send in the network so that we can check to see whether that state is being followed. Right? So this is a dynamic test. We must use the network in order to do a dynamic test. We must put packets through it. So we're going to try and figure out what packets that we can send to check that it's working correctly. So we're going to assume that there are test these test packets could come from an end host. They could be a special box. They could be the switches themselves that are exchanging packets. It doesn't really matter. And they're going to send packets through the network in order to test this out. So what is the minimum num number of packets that we need to test that every rule in every table is being followed and isolate any fault? So that once we know that it's not being followed, say it's that box, it's that rule that somebody has, has, is implementing incorrectly. What is that minimum set? So in order to do this, we, um, uh, I'll show you in a moment um, this working on the, the, uh, on, on the Stanford backbone. Again, the, 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 the basic setup is there will be test packets that will be sent from the edge or from the switches. They will exchange them a particularly carefully set of, uh, set of packets with particular headers that is designed in order to find all of the, uh, all of the failures. And then once we've found that failure, to try and home in on it and say, what was the cause? So for example, let's say that, we, uh, uh, that, 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 that there was a failure in this, in this router here in red. And we had established that from a packet that passed through it, and we knew that there was a, there was a fault along this line here. We then home in by sending more packets and say, in this particular case, we know that those links are potentially in error as well. We send more packets over paths that eventually work, so we can eliminate them from our inquiries. We can keep doing that, finding new paths, new routers, new links that work, until eventually we can say, it's that one. And then we can take this a little bit further and find which rule is in violation. So how does it work? So I'm going to call this ATPG, or automatic test packet generation. It uses the same technique as before, the fact that these geometric transfer functions operate in the network to that we can think of all switches and routers as performing these geometric transfer functions. As before, we take the full set at A and see how it gets transferred through the network, how it gets transformed through to the destination. What we're interested in is what is the full set of packets that A can send to B that test every rule? So by taking the inverse function of those that reached B, taking them back through the network, we say, this is the minimal set of packets that covers the reachability at B. So by sending these, we have tested all the rules that govern reachability to B. And so these become our test packets. You might be thinking, that's an awful lot that you have to do. So how many packets would be, how many packets would be needed? I'll come to that in a moment before I do that. This is, uh, there's a demo that's, that's, that's outside that you can see that shows this as well. Let me see if I can do this. So this represents on the left-hand side the Stanford backbone. It's the real one on the left-hand side. And then we're going to look, look at how we might uh, discover bugs on the other side. Let me find this. So we're going to start by in, injecting a, uh, a bug here. By the way, if you, in, in case you can't see this, let me just show you. Um, this is the topology here of that, of that network. This is it superimposed on the map. So the topology is not particularly complicated, as is typical of a backbone network like this. So we're going to inject an error. And this injecting of an error is taking place here. So I think this is going to work. So what it's done in that particular router that has this funny name is just gone in and changed that rule. And it's gone and broken that rule. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to try and detect it. The detection that takes place in the background 
can go, in this particular case, it can go and run a mini-net emulation of that network, send all of the test packets across the network, home in on the fold, and then find it, which it identified here. Happen to get it right. I will tell you that this demo is slightly rigged in that the emulation wasn't actually happening there. It was taken from a database. If you go outside, you'll see it actually taking place from the emulation. I didn't want to take the risk on the stage here. So how many packets does it take to do that? It takes about 4,000 packets that you need to send across the network in order to be able to test all of those rules. It's rather odd because there are 750,000 rules in the network, but there's so much structure that we have in the network that was there deliberately because it reflects the intent that we had in the first place. And so that structure reveals itself through these geometric transformations, and so then we need a relatively small number of packets to do that test. So they could be sent by the end hosts, the end hosts they could be sent by the switches, and that number of packets is small enough that you could test this 10 times per second using only 1% of the link rate. So it allows for very rapid, if there was a, a malicious intrusion into the network that was a compromise of the hardware, you would catch it, you could catch it very easily in a fraction of a second. <clears throat> so what would come next? What could you do after that? So you could actually use the same method for doing automatic performance testing for loss rate, flow rate, latency in the network. So an example might be an application, its packets have been mapped to a congested router queue or a bad router queue that has experienced congestion from others. This will also allow you to figure out which packets that you would need to generate in order to be able to determine that quickly and then for the control plane or for a program to, to take corrective action. So it would help you identify the queue, determine which headers, which applications had incurred the, perfor the poor performance. The third one, third example I'd like to, uh, to, to go through as a, as a method is interactive debugging. This is something that we don't have available to us today, and I'm going to describe this uh, quite uh, briefly. So this is work with Nikhil, Brandon, and Vimal, who are PhD students at Stanford, and my colleague, David Messieris. So the idea here is to find bugs and their root cause in an operational network. It's perhaps a method of last resort when, you haven't, when the other methods haven't told you what's broken, but that's often because of the complexity of the control program is just too great to be able to catch that, catch that in some invariant checks. So a good analogy to think of here is how we debug a program. So here is a stack trace or a backtrace in a, in a software program. What does that do for us? Imagine that we have a function at the top. U is some function of B, which in turn is some function of C. And we suspect that something's going wrong because this variable U often has the wrong value. So we want to ask the question, when is it that it takes on this error value? So I might set a breakpoint that says, tell me if ever it takes on this value. All right, so we've all done this as in uh, whether it's GDB or, or, or using some Python debugger or whatever in order to de debug a program. And it will go through a backtrace and say, here are all the sequence events that it can read from the stack that will tell us why that event occurred, or at least the sequence of events leading to it, so that then we as humans can go in and figure out what the problem was. <clears throat> so the problem is that when an operational network behaves, it's very hard to find that root cause. So the goal here is to allow users to define a network breakpoint, to trigger on that error condition that they suspect is happening, and then capture and reconstruct the sequence of events leading to that breakpoint. So we'll return to the Stanford network again here, and we're going to imagine that there's a box sitting on that network, a server, that is going to collect the state as it goes, as, as the network progresses, and that we will be able to identify a, a breakpoint, for example, in this case, I suspect that the, uh, the, 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 uh, it's happening at switch S, and I'm gonna look for particular addresses in packets in the network. It could be anything that's in the, in the, uh, in the header. <clears throat> then when packets are sent, as it transverses the network, it's gonna send a little postcard. It's gonna send a little postcard that says, I visited here, I visited here, I visited here, I visited here. So there'll be a little bit of information that will come over to this collector that will gather that information. And then the collector will say, hey, you just violated this, you hit this breakpoint. 
and this breakpoint gets triggered. And then from this state that's being collected, we're going to, re we're going to uh, determine what the, uh, the, the sequence of events were through the network, because we've captured them all, and we can say, well, this packet hit the first switch, the state looked like this. It hit the second switch, the state looked like this. And so we can reconstruct all of the state that it encountered, and therefore try and figure out what that root causes. So we're taking advantage of the fact that at the top there is a program that is being compiled down into this state. And as that state gets compiled and put into the network, we're going to observe it. We're going to observe it as it goes by. So we're going to record it. And we're going to re record the flow state and the version of that state. So every time it's updated, we're going to keep track of the version. And then for each packet, the ID of that packet, enough of a digest of that packet to be able to identify it later, and the version that it saw. So the version ties these two things together. So for each packet ID, we can see the flow state, the flow table state that it encountered. And so therefore, later, we can go and build the whole thing. So notice that this is a, this is a passive process. Right? So long as the network can be told to generate these postcards, after that, everything else is just observing what happened without changing it. So in our particular case, the breakpoint would have told us that there was an error in the flow table. And that error in the flow table was something that we didn't want. This was the cause that it says, if you see a packet that looks like this, then drop it. And so as a developer, we would be able to go back and say, that wasn't in our intent. We hadn't actually planned that. That was where the error took place. So as network developers, programmers can debug their control programs this way. And the network operators, they can find a policy error. They can send an error report to their switch vendor to say that something was broken. And here is, this, here is the, 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 the trace of that error in my network so that you can debug it. Or you can send an error report to a control program vendor and say, your, network, your program broke my network. Here is the trace of it breaking it. Go fix it. So we have a first working prototype of this. It's called NDB, Network Debugger, and uh, works without changes to, to OpenFlow. And we noticed that when, when asking the question of how this would perform on the Stanford backbone, this could be a single server. But you might imagine that it would become commonplace for a small set of servers to be present in, back, in networks in order to be able to switch on this debugging as you needed, to be able to collect that backtrace and then report the error and track it down. Finally, the, the perhaps the holy grail, the thing that we'd really like to be able to do is not only find the bug in the, in the state, but be able to tie that back to the program and say, what was it that the programmer was doing? That's a, a natural thing to try next. So in summary, I'd like to say that errors can take place in four places. They can take place in the infrastructure. There's a lot of code in that infrastructure. They can take place in the program that we write. They can take place in the state that gets compiled down and the way that that state is then executed. And we need to make huge improvements in the way that we study all of these things and create that intellectual foundation for all of these. One thing is clear, that after all of this innovation that I think that we will see over the next few years, that will come from new companies, from researchers, and from people who are operating and needing to fix their own bugs, that I really believe this, that we will formally verify our networks and we will identify bugs, then systematically track down their root cause. The last question I want to ask is, so will you? And I always wanted to finish a talk with the phrase, yo mama. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
in commodity chips. And we have now many, many engineers skilled in those same things that are going to be left without jobs. What's going to happen? I, by the way, I'm also an executive and manager at IEEE Communication Society. What's going to happen to all of those engineers? How are universities going to change and modify their double E curriculums to support this brave new world? Thank you. That's a great question. That's a great question. So first of all, I think that the jobs are secure. There'll actually be an awful lot more of them. But before I get to that, let me just talk about the education part of it. Um, <clears throat> it's not as though any of the things that you described become obsolete. They have strong intellectual foundation that are still widely used and will continue to be widely used. All of the, all of the techniques that are used for ASIC development, for, descri for de uh, designing the physical layer, for the information theory that underlies how, how the physical layer works. All of that is still true. None of that changes. None of that goes away. All that we're trying to do is learn, all that we're trying to do is to learn from those disciplines that have that strong foundation and find how to build a similarly strong foundation in networking. If we can build that strong foundation in networking, then the networks will work better. They will be more reliable. We will need to not only innovate in those methods, but there will be entire businesses and companies that come along and provide tools. That $10 billion, tool, billion dollar tool industry for the ASIC uh, business and for the software business didn't happen by accident. It happened because it's needed. We need that too. And so we will have that and we will train people it will take a while, and I don't have the answer to how we will train them for next year or the year after. Because at the moment, this is in the research labs, and it's the graduate students and the PhD students who are making most of the innovation. In the next step, you are absolutely right. This needs to move to the undergraduate curriculum. It's beginning to appear in a smattering of the, of the textbooks. But I hope that over the next two years, not only in the undergraduate curriculum, but then in the equivalence of the CCNA training, that this will start to include SDN and these methods as well, to create that more consistent, that stronger intellectual foundation for our field. So I'm not worried about the jobs. I think there will be a lot more of them, because our industry will get much bigger as it becomes more open. Um, good morning. I'm Daniel Chong from Acton in Taiwan. And uh, earlier in the uh, talk, you talked about that there's a test tool that we can get, and then you went on to talk about NDB. So which, uh, what is the test tool, and uh, sure. is it an open flow <coughs> tester, and are there directions to get it? So there are a bunch of prototype in the lab type of tools, um, and there are different degrees of, 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 of development. And the best thing would be for us to talk afterwards, but this hassle tool is something that a few people have taken and have run in their networks to do the static checking of their networks. The other ones are sort of following on behind. And uh, so let's talk, talk afterwards, and we'll be um, uh, happy, to, happy to share those with you. I have basically two questions. My name is Thomas Rumbold. In the telco environment, in the recent years, Telco parts and IT parts move together. And 80% of all the crashes of networks are basically based on database problems, database synchronization problems, uh, um, uh, wrong in, uh, introductions or changes in databases and things like that. I was a bit irritated that the name IT databases did not show up in any version of your talk. How do you see that? And the second question then is, uh, people like Facebook are writing their software in a fault-tolerant way. What do you want to do in these networking environments for that type as well? So the first question, it's great questions. So the first question was uh, about where does the database appear? Where is that in, 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 this, in this view? It's part of that infrastructure. And any self-respecting control plane today is using a distributed uh, database in order to maintain that global view of the network. So it's right in there. It's a part. Nowadays, I think we, 
we perhaps can take it for granted, as I did, that it's there and present. Now, where are the errors that take place in, 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 that, in, in those databases? So for sure, databases are not perfect. They've improved significantly over time. And so they will continue to be bugs in those databases. There are the bugs that were put there by humans through the control programs. Clearly, that was the part that I was focusing on here. As those databases improve, then we hope that through the interactive debugging, you'll be able to see the, the, the root cause of it, it might mean that you have to phone Oracle and say fix it or go and fix the open source database that you're using. But for sure, that will continue to happen. There's nothing here that's inconsistent with that. That's just part of the infrastructure and will continue to be so. If I might just answer your second, second question, which is about fault tolerance and about fault tolerant design. So I think that fault tolerance, as we see it through scale out design of networks, whether it's in data centers or the WAN, is a very, very significant part of SDN, particularly in the early days. It's there. It's not, it's not so relevant to what I was describing here. We would hope that there would be a layer of fault tolerance that would mean that while you're figuring out what the bug is, that the network will continue to operate because you've built enough fault tolerance into it. I take the question from Christos over here. One of the issues uh, with respect to uh, correctness verification is how do I know that the software I write to discover bugs is bug free itself. I'm sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> so uh, when, I, when I write software to discover bugs, how do I know that the actual that software is bug free itself? You don't. You don't. That's why you want a whole collection of tricks and techniques. Right? So like in software development, we have a whole bag of tricks. And then you use all of them. Because you never know that any one particular one will be, will be perfect. So the, the more, the better. That's why I think that we will have, so if you look at the, in the ASIC industry, you don't buy one tool for synopsis. You buy 50 or 60 tools, and then you tie them all and hope that they will bring a different view of the bugs that you will inevitably have created. And sure, those tools have bugs too. Um, I, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I see how um, uh, I see the advantages how they, you can reduce bugs and errors in the network, but I was wondering if you have any ideas on how you solve uh, uh, like dynamic issues in the network, like a link goes down or there is high CPU and hence uh, packets are not sent or uh, some strange packets are being inserted. Like, uh, do you have any ideas on how you can reduce errors or bugs in, 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 those, in, in those areas? So the first, the first one that you mentioned was links going down, obviously a very common problem. Um, if you want to determine whether a link has gone down, it's part of the state of the system. So this test packet generation method will, will find that just as it will find the, it, so it's, it's just another type of hardware failure, just like uh, if there's an error in a memory or an ASIC. So that would show up and it would be able to ident identify it and isolate that, uh, that error. As to its root cause, as to whether it was caused by something that was in the, the physical layer that's a little bit beyond any of these particular techniques, then you would go to some of the techniques that, that, are, that are used for figuring out things like the, uh, uh, the size of the eye or whatever that's appropriate for that particular, for that particular link. So as I said, I said earlier, this would be a, there would be a collection of tools that, that, that would expect to be developed. I think we're just seeing the beginning, we're just scratching the surface of what tools we would expect to be available. I described three here. There are four or five that other people have described. I would expect there to be dozens that we would use all together to be able to try and find these. Now, the more they can be tied together as a suite of tools that can help us identify errors at all sorts of layers and then home in on it, that would be great. OK, maybe last question. Yeah, I have uh, Hiroki Yoshida from Cisco. Um, I have a question that's similar to the first uh, question. Um, we call ourselves network engineers. Um, we have, you know, what we call 6,000 RFCs in our heads, and that's how we do our job. What, in your view, in three years from now, or five years from now, what do you think of the role of these network engineers? Do you think that network engineers are gonna be a bunch of computer programmers, or gonna be working in the 10 billion data tool industry, or what do you think is the, or are they gonna be just wiped out of the whole industry? <laughs> <clears throat> so in, the, in, in computer systems and in, in, in data centers, there are plenty of people who would be computer engineers that are making everything work. Right? There are plenty of, plenty of people doing that. But they are totally dominated in number by people who are developing the code in the first place. Right? 
It's not clear in networking what the ratio is, but my guess is that there are almost as many people, maybe even more people, who are keeping things working than developing it in the first place. I think that ratio will change. And the reason that we are in the state that we are today, where we have to have huge numbers of people in order to maintain the networks, is because we don't have that strong formal foundation. And the ones that we do, then yes, there will be less of a need for people who are making the network work on a day-to-day -day basis, because it will be more automated. But I think that there will be far more things that we can do with the network, so there will be a massive increase in the number of people who are programming the network. So in part, I would agree with your, the, the sentiment that I think that that will shift, but I think the pie will get so much bigger that the industry will grow enormously as a consequence. Okay, with that, again, thanks, Nick.